Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Thank you. Nice, nice welcome. Everything about this conference has been nice. You know, a lot of food in the morning. Didn't even have to buy it. You know, a lot of hard work in there. And a lot of, a lot of support to the Elanons also. Because they, they helped contribute to that. But Al's been up here telling stories all, all day, you know, and yesterday. And I tell you what, it's fun to Pat saying. One day Jesus was on earth and he was walking down the street and he came to a corner. And there was a man crying. He said, why are you crying, my son? He said, blind and I can't see. And Jesus healed him. Went in another corner and a man was crying. He said, why are you crying, my son? He said, I'm lame and I can't walk. And Jesus healed him. And Pat was riding in his car one day all alone and he was crying. And Jesus appeared in the seat next to him. He said, why are you crying, Pat? Said, I got to go to A meetings with Al. And he said, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus started crying. <laughs> so to loosen up, they want to play Can You Top This? <laughs> Can I read a little something before I start? I Got a lot of mileage out of it. I cut it out of the newspaper, and maybe some of you can identify with this. Dear Professor, this was told to me by a guy from Torrington, Connecticut. A man was driving home late one evening going south in I-91. He had several drinks, and it's so obvious the police soon pulled him over. As the cop approached the car, an accident occurred in the opposite lane, so the cop told the drunk to get out of the car and wait. The cop crossed the median to see if he could help the accident victim. The drunk waited for a while, but then decided to hop in his car and he started off for home. He told his wife to tell the police if they should call. He'd been home all night and sober as a judge. The next morning, the doorbell rang. When he answered it, two state cops were standing there, including the one who had stopped him. Naturally, he claimed he had been home all night. His wife backed up the story, but the cops asked if they could look in the garage. The man, not sure what was going on, said, sure. So they went to the garage, opened the door, and there was a police cruiser, its lights still flashing. <laughs> Those kind of things used to happen to me. <laughs> My wife's been in al for 31 years, you know, and uh, I'm accustomed to the al handshake. I don't know if any of you over here are familiar with it. It goes like this. <laughs> I, I told a fellow the other day, I said, I finally found out why those Elvinons close their eyes when we make love to them. They can't see us having a good time. <laughs> a lot of support from Elvinon in my life. My name is Bill. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about alcoholism. I'm not going to talk to you about the typical alcoholic personality. I'm not going to talk to you about whether God is a male or a female. I'm not going to talk to you about whether uh, defects of character are different than shortcomings. I'm going to tell you what a bottle of whiskey and did in my life, and whether you understand it yet or not today. A bottle of whiskey does the same thing today to a man or a woman as it did 100 years ago. And the only program we've found over the years that's been successful in treating the alcoholic has been AA with the best results. A lot of people talk about going to a treatment center to get well. Well, when you come into AA, you're coming into AA for treatment. And the treatment is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which made an impact worldwide. A lot of people don't understand it. They always think as if they, they go someplace to be treated and come here and tell us what they did. AA is a treatment for alcoholism. And I've learned since I've been in AA, there's a big difference between an alcohol problem in a behavioral disorder, see? A lot of people want to talk about behavioral disorders. You got to be careful when you come in here because we try to get away from that stuff. And the world's most renowned psychiatrist gave us the format for Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of people say it was divinely inspired, but it came from Carl Jung. He gave it to Roland Hazard who went overseas to study with him. Now, here's a point I want to bring out just to emphasize what I'm saying. Carl Jung took Roland Hazard to this therapy, 
He said he learned the inner workings of his mind so well he believed relapse unthinkable. That's what a lot of people are trying to do, learn what made them alcoholic, the inner workings of their mind. Nevertheless, he was drunk a short period of time. He went back overseas. He wanted to know why, and Carl Jung said this, chronic alcoholics must have a spiritual experience in order to recover a psychic change to a spiritual experience. And that was the whole format for the program of AA. Joined the Oxford Movement, came home, got the message to Ebby, and Ebby brought it to Bill. And lo and behold, there was the beginning of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's important to remember that because too many people come in this program anymore suffering from the paralysis of analysis. We're too deep into this stuff. This is a simple program. I had a very simple statement that said, keep it simple, and somebody tacked a word on there, stupid. Not stupid, it's keep it simple. Somebody else said, keep it simple, it's a simple program for complicated people. We're not complicated people, we're sick. You ever hear somebody stand up and say, I'm not a bad person getting good? I'm a sick person getting well? Because we consider alcoholism an illness, a disease. It's not too, too well received yet. You know, alcoholism is still shame-based. A lot of people would rather be mentally ill than come here and be an alcoholic. And only we can change that. Well, I came in here because I started drinking at an early age. I was 13, 14, I had a regular drinking pattern at this time. And it wasn't alcoholism because I was choosing to do it. You know, there's a big difference between choosing to get drunk and getting drunk when you don't want to. Now, after choosing to get drunk, I, I had a lot of problems in my life as a teenager. And somewhere along the line in the early 20s, I was married. I had a wife and two children. And I got a mandate. I was told to quit drinking or else. It went something like this. I'm tired of playing catch-up. I don't want to live this way anymore. Every time we get a few dollars ahead, you're in jail on a DWI. We have to hire an attorney, pay him money. We go to court, we pay the court money. Our insurance goes up, and we spend the next year paying off your DWI. If that doesn't happen, you go to the bar room, and you spend more money than you have, and we spend the next two or three paychecks paying off your bar bill. If that doesn't happen, you're sick, you're hungover, you can't go to work, our paycheck is short, and you still drink. I'm not going to live this way. If you drink one more time, I'm going to leave you. Now, it's not my idea to try to convince you that I didn't want a divorce, and I didn't. I, I wouldn't want a divorce then any more than I want a divorce now. And I did the only thing I knew as an alcoholic, and probably most alcoholics throughout history. I quit drinking. It's a common, common fact. If you're having a problem with it, quit. And I quit the only way I knew how. I got rid of the alcohol in the house. I didn't go to the bars, and I didn't run with my drinking buddies. Same thing we recommend in AA. And I quit drinking for three or four or five months. I can't remember exactly how long. And the last thing I remember is going out the door and my wife screaming at me. Would you rather drink than have a wife and family and I had no more idea why I was drunk then than I had when I came into AA and got drunk twice. I had two, two times I got drunk in this program. And uh, May 11th, 1964, I had my last drink, so I've been sober 35 years. And I had about three years before that accumulated. And I, I, and I was always an active member. I've never been inactive. Okay. And when I quit drinking, I became a model husband. I, I did everything I could around the house. And Carol today called me a model husband, my wife today. And we celebrated 25 years of marriage. And I was pretty proud of being called a model husband. And one day I was doing some work in the dictionary with the kids' schoolwork. And I looked at the definition of a model, a small imitation of the real thing. <laughs> So I don't know if she was complimenting me or not, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I start suffering, all right, from the effects of alcohol. And uh, I couldn't quit. 
I could say quit short periods of time, and throughout history, people have tried to quit drinking just by abstinence. And a lot of people come to AA and they quit drinking by abstinence. And that's a half measure. Because, see, once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. And physically, you can never change that. But somewhere along the line, we had to find the X factor. And there come the 12 steps of AA. Physical, I'm in charge of. Mental, the steps take care of. That's what I never had previous in my life. All I did was stop drinking and I would go back. That mental obsession. I was like a transmission out of fluid. You know, it says uh, uh, not drinking is an abnormal condition for an alcoholic, and that's where I was. I understand this rib, restless, irritable, and discontented. I got that way, you know? And when you get that way, that's the definition of a dry drunk. I'll give you an example of a guy in dry drunk. Got up one morning, his wife said, would you like to have breakfast? I said, I have breakfast every morning. Why wouldn't I have it today? He said, well, what do you want? He said, give me eggs. How do you want them? Fry one and scramble the other. He fried one egg and scrambled the other, and he looked at me and he said, you scrambled the wrong one. <laughs> little exaggeration, but you get where I'm coming from. I had that a lot of times. I needed booze. I just couldn't function without it. Well, I won the Korean War, and that's a story in itself, but I was going to college under the GI Bill. And uh, consequences of my alcoholism are creeping up on me, and the only way I can control it is by not drinking. First step of AA. But always back again. And I'm in college, I'm doing well, and December 21st, 1956, our class threw a party for the holiday season. Food over here, booze over here. You eat at home, right? You drink at a party. On the way home, I had a head-on collision. Two people were killed, a woman in one car and a young boy in a car with me. And Christmas Eve of that year, there was two funerals. I ruined the holiday season for quite a few families. And as a result, I was sentenced to the state reformatory for traffic manslaughter. Resentment, self-pity, I had it. My attorney asked me to get a letter from the priest. I needed all the help I could. I went to see the priest, I asked him for a letter of support, and he said, who are you? I don't know who you are. And he knew who I was. But he looked in a book of contributions, and my name wasn't there. He said, you better find somebody that knows you. Well, I didn't get that letter. When I went to prison, somebody would come to me and say, what are you here for, Bill? I was no longer there for manslaughter. You know why I was there now, don't you? The priest didn't write me a letter. Forget the manslaughter charge. I'm building up a case for when I come into AA, why I don't need God and spirituality. Looking at one incident. Well, I'm in that institution for nine months, tenth month I should go to pro board. Twelfth month I should come home, good guy like me. No thoughts of alcohol, wasn't any around. A man walked by my cell one day and he said, the man in the laundry has got booze. And for three nights I didn't sleep clicked right into that alcohol again, that mental obsession. Not to get drunk. I never went any place to get drunk. I never went into a bar room and told a bartender, give me a shot in the beer, I want to get divorced. I thought I'd take a shot in the beer, it's going to make me feel better. You know, I'm going to control it this time. I'm not going to have the same problem I had last time. You know, that delusion? I never went into a bar room and said, give me a shot in the beer, I want to lose my job. Give me a shot in the beer, I want to go to jail. Never happened. Always going to make me feel good. So I started in there, and third third day I went down to that laundry room to get a little taste. Not to get drunk, just a little taste. And when I went to the pro board, I got 16 more months in prison for being drunk. Now, do you think I did that because I would rather be drunk than sober? I did that because that's typical alcoholic behavior. That's why people think we're nuts. I don't have the proper attitude when I'm dealing with alcohol. I just don't have them. When I started drinking, alcohol became a mind-expanding chemical for me. And it did for a lot of other people, for my buddies. You know, social drinkers drink for the same reasons we started. Don't think that we're alcoholics and they're not, that they don't have the same defects that we have. We have one big difference. They can shut it off. We can't when we get alcohol. There's the big difference. 
And boy, I got this problem now. I, I went back in my cell and I took what we call an AA in inventory and I came to a conclusion. People that drink have more problems than people that don't drink have. I'm never going to drink again. And the guys picked me up bringing me home when I was paroled. I'm divorced now. I'm only about 15 minutes out of Mansfield and there's one of these red signs of blinking lights, liquor. Pull in there. Can't bring to mind the pain, the suffering, humiliation of a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. Here I am. I, I don't know how to deal with alcohol. Some people don't understand this. Some people in AA don't. You know? But there I am. Now, I've got 18 years parole. I have to pull one year clean, and I'm off paper. And I'm home six months. And I'm standing before the judge, and he said, How do you plead the DWI? I said, Not guilty, Your Honor. Very polite. And he set a trial date for me. And when I came to trial, I was drunk. And he looked at me, and he said, You're intoxicated. And I said, Who are you, Dick Tracy? Back to jail I went. Now you're standing looking at one of these deadbeat dads you hear so much about. The judge condemning me and he states that I'm the scum of the earth. They won't pay for my children's food and their clothing. I've got my head bowed and I'm not the scum of the earth and I love my children. And, and, and I love them then as much as I do today. But I had alcoholism. And I don't have to make excuses because after I sobered up, I... I I met all my obligations, but when I was drinking active alcoholism, I could not. You know, get down from that bench and take that Zorro robe off. Get rid of this policeman, I'll show you he doesn't love his kids. I can't do any of this. Sad part of it is, nobody ever gave me one of these slips of paper that's floating around the AA and said, go to Alcoholics Anonymous, you may have an alcohol problem. They kept throwing me in jail. One of the first things I became active in when I sobered up was the Big Brothers movement in AA that we had. We used to go to prisons and jails and sponsor people out who didn't have any place to go or a job. And we knocked on judges' doors and we told judges, it's better to treat an alcoholic than put him in jail. And they started in our area giving these slips and a lot of people complain about it. AA did that. We believed in it. Well, somewhere along the line, I, I, I came to some conclusions. And I was sitting in a bar room one Saturday morning, and I decided there must be more to life than this, to work all week long to get a paycheck on Friday to be broke on Monday. Must be more to life than this. And I decided to go to AA. And when I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I met a group of people, men. There wasn't too many women around at the time. And uh, they shared with me what they had. And they misdirected me. Not intentionally. They shared what they had. Because you can't transmit in here what you don't have. And they had the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a worthy organization. And a lot of people can stay different a lot of different stay sober a lot of different ways in the fellowship. And that's what they gave me, the fellowship of AA to stay sober on. And I understand it wasn't enough for me. As long as I go to the meetings and do what I have to do, then I won't drink. That was my program. It was an I program. No basis for God. You don't get a spiritual experience or awakening by staying in God. I mean, staying in self rather than God. And that's where I was. And we had a little thing, we titled this little group of guys, there's about 12, 15 of us, individual programs. You know, we were bigger than AA. You don't need God, big book steps and spirituality. Just do what I do. There's a guy on an ego trip. Okay. Rarely have I seen an individual fail who thoroughly followed my path. <laughs> you know, that's, that's where I was. And I came in here and I stayed here for seven months, and if I missed a meeting, maybe one, and I got drunk. And I came back here. And I 
gravitated over to that little nucleus of individual programs again. And again, I was pointed out certain individuals in here. Stay away from them. Why? They're fanatics. All they talk about is God and big books. Stay away from them. They'll drive you crazy. They'll get you drunk. And I avoided them. I became loyal to this individual program group. And after 27 months, I was the hub. People coming and going. We made statements like this. What keeps me sober may get you drunk, and what gets you drunk may keep me sober. You know where you're at. 27 months I got drunk. I got worse, and I came back to AA. And I was here about three more years, so it'd be about 32 years ago. I had three more years in a program. I was secretary of our central office. I was chairman at three groups. I was speaking to the patients at Serenity Hall. I was chairman. I was doing. I, w I was sponsoring people, and I'm sitting in my bedroom and I'm fighting booze. I don't mean should I have a drink to go out and dance or talk to the girls. I don't want a drink. And this thing's going squirrely up here. I'm thinking to myself, what am I, a freak? I'm doing everything these people told me to do, and here I am, fighting booze. And my telephone rang that day, and a man came into my life who gave me Alcoholics Anonymous as I try to practice it today. And he asked me what was wrong. And I said, Dan, I've lost my enthusiasm for AA. I've done everything you people have told me to do. And I'm going to get drunk. He said, Bill, the root of the word enthusiasm is theo, meaning God. And unless you find God in your life, you'll never have enthusiasm. Come down to see me. And I went to see Dan that day. And the first thing he asked me is, Bill, had you ever taken a third step in AA? And I told him, no. I had never gone through the steps of AA. I was told I didn't have to. I was told all I have to do is not take the first drink, be honest about it, work with another drunk, and you'll never drink again. And for some people, this may work. But our founders made a statement in there. He said, if you're seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle-of-the-road solution. And I was probably middle-of-the-road. And Dan guided me through the steps. And I found out that I, I didn't know too much about AA. I knew a lot about personal uh, ideas, conclusions that we made up ourselves, but direction none. And he guided me through the steps. I took an inventory with him. I took a fifth step with him. He took me to the rest of the program, told me about making amends. I had made no amends in here. And I became active in AA. And I do a lot of fifth steps. I've been in treatment for 28 years. I ran treatment centers. And, you know, at one time, it was socially acceptable to throw Christians to the lions. It wasn't morally right, but it was socially acceptable. And what I have found out over the years is we have a lot of people coming into AA today who don't really understand what a fearless moral inventory is. And they give you this, well, everybody's doing it. It may be socially acceptable, but it's not morally right. You're doing a good fourth and fifth step. You have to check into our behavioral pattern. Amends? Never. I bought a new car when I sobered up. Rode around town, hung the horn, and waved at everybody. Look what AA is doing for me. Materialism. And the amends that I made of where I did damage to other people, those were simple. But the amends of forgiveness where I had to forgive somebody else for what they did to me was difficult. And I'm meeting more and more people who are coming into AA today, I don't know how it is in your area, who feel they have the right to have resentment. Really understand that it states in our program that resentment is the number one offender. It's more people drunk than anything else. And we have a program that's designed to work with these resentments. And I hear, I don't know how many versions of how to work with resentment. Failing to understand is the beginning of our therapy in AA starts with dealing with resentment. And in the fourth step, it says these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away. This was our course of action. 
When a person offends us, we say to ourselves, perhaps this person is spiritually sick, how may I be of service to him? Thy will not my will be done. We avoid retaliation or argument. That was a mechanical practice for me. I practiced it mechanically until it became a part of my life. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous is loaded with therapy, and people coming into AA don't know that today. They're always out here, somebody else. Three weeks in a program, never went through the steps. I need more than AA. Well, how do you know? You haven't been there long enough to work the program. Give it a fair shot. A lot of reasons why we're alcoholics, and a lot of suggestions on how to quit. You know, the smartest man in the world has to be the bartender to get a good job like he has. And I was a bartender a few times, but I always lost the job. When he made me bartender, I went into partnership, but I was the only one who knew it, you know. And a bartender said to me one night, he said, Bill, do you know why you get so drunk? I said, why? He said, you drink shots and beer. Just drink beer. And I drank beer all night and I got drunk. I come back, I said, I drank beer all night and I got drunk. He said, too much volume for you. Look how small you are. I didn't have all of this on me at the time. And he gave me a suggestion, just drink whiskey. But with a warning, don't drink any 7-Up ginger ale or Coca-Cola. That sweet stuff will get you sick. Not the booze. So I drank whiskey with soda and water, and I got drunk. I come back. He said, well, do you have a headache, a hangover? I said, yes. Take a bottle of beer home with you. Take the cap off. Put it under your bed. And when you wake up in the morning with that big head, drink that flat beer. I got up in the morning, big head, drank that flat beer, heaved it all over my mother's wall. You want to keep from getting drunk tonight? I said, yes. He said, drink olive oil. It coats your stomach. And that worked. I drank a glass of olive oil that night, and I didn't get drunk. I got so sick on the olive oil, I never made it out. <laughs> we laugh. But did you notice something? I never questioned the bartender. But I come to the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I sit down at an AA meeting, I don't have a job, I don't have a wife, I don't have a family, I don't have any dignity, I don't have any self-respect, I don't have anything. And they tell me what to do to stay sober, and I tell them I don't have to do anything in here. What makes me an authority on recovery now? Anybody gave me a job and paid me $500 a week, or gave you a $500 a week, and when you got your money, they said, give it to me every week. And I'm going to beat the hell out of you, throw you in jail, tear your clothes, take your dignity, self-respect away, take your wife and family away, may even ask you for your life, but you must pay me. What would you think I'd tell him? That's what our addiction's telling us. Give me everything near and dear to you, and this is how I'm going to pay you back, and we resist recovery. Okay. Well... I start following the therapy of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I find out things happened to me when I started going through the program. Because I was the guy in AA who came up to you and told you how wonderful your life would become as a result of AA. How wonderful your life would become. I told them about promises. I heard them read at meetings. And when I walked away, I said to myself, why don't you believe what you're saying, Bill? Why are you trying to convince yourself this is real? Do you know why? I had never experienced it. And I'm not alone. You're sitting in this room this evening and you haven't experienced the promises of AA. You probably haven't worked the steps. You may be the best person able to define the words and never have the experience. If you're anything like me, today I can tell you I don't have to define the experience of the Twelve Promises, something you feel, you experience it. My grandfather had a bad back. When I was young, he tried to tell me how the pain was. And I would pain relative to certain parts of my body and thought I understood it. Two years ago, my back really went out. No explanation necessary now. I've experienced it. 
And it's like the promises in this program. You can define the words in there, but till you experience, you never really know what you're dealing with. Give it a fair shot. Well, I sobered up. I came back in there the last time I was really bad. I was a wino. You know, I, I'm one of these guys who couldn't differentiate the true from the false. I was begging drinks in the morning. I was doing odd jobs around bars for drinks. You know, I woke up one morning suffering from claustrophobia. It was real. I'm screaming. I could touch the walls. My mother came in. She said, what's wrong, son? I said, Mom, the cool walls are closing in on me. I said, you're damn drunk. You're in the hallway. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at. Nighttime, I'm seeing the movies. No key to the house. I have to ring the doorbell to come home and get in the house at night. She took the key away. I bring too many drunks home at night. You know, fry eggs and bacon, eat all the leftovers, drink the milk. My mother got tired of that. Come home, ring the doorbell, put the light on, see if I'm alone. She let me in and frisked me. One night, she found a wine bottle. That's the last one she ever got. I put it on the windowsill and ring the doorbell. You know, one night I came in, she didn't frisk me. I felt let down. I got so accustomed to that. I went to the door and I pounded on the door. I said, Mom, you didn't search me. She said, go to sleep, Bill. I pounded louder. Mom, you didn't search me. And I don't know how long this went on. And Uncle yelled from across the hallway. He said, Mary, get up and search, Bill. I have to go to work in the morning. <laughs> went into the bedroom opened the window, sat on the bed drinking my wine, and broke out laughing. I'm going places. That's what came into AA this last time. And for me to be living the life I'm living today, it's incomprehensible. Never dreamed it. I, I got active in this program. I did a lot of voluntary court work. And I became the chief probation officer in the court system in Lorain County. Think of that. Ex-convict, threatened with another year in jail for non-support, arrested 34 times just in the city of Lorraine. I'm an officer of the court. A lot of people couldn't understand this. My mother couldn't. But she was proud. Anytime anybody came over to the house, first thing she would say is, you know where my bill works? He works in a courthouse with the judges. And the people she was talking to thought I had on enough John enough on the job training I should have been there years ago <laughs> and I say this to men in our area if you ever need detox and you don't have insurance how do you get detox you hit a cop you want to get detox without insurance you hit a cop and you're going to get detox and I hit a cop one night and I got detox and one of the police officers who detoxed me he was in a courtroom and he didn't know what I was doing there and he yelled across the courtroom and he said, hey, Rummy, come here. The judge slammed that gavel down. He said, this man is a respected member of this judicial staff. He's to be treated with a dignity and respect to a member of this staff. He's Mr. Findlay. Boy, every time I walked through the courtroom after that, I'd come up to the cop, I'd point at him and say, don't forget the mister. And I want to come to Alcoholics Anonymous and sit down in one of these chairs and feel like I'm being punished. If anybody in this room feels they're being punished because they're in AA, you need more than AA. Go get it. This is a life-giving, life-changing, life-rewarding program. No male or female sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous knows where his or her life will go as a result of applying this program to their lives any more than I did mine. And I can't tell you where it'll go. But I'll guarantee each and every one of you in this room this evening, I'll tell you exactly where your life is going to go if you don't stay sober. Right down the tubes, I've watched it. Thousands of people. And people are concerned today. What's happening in Alcoholics Anonymous? Dual addictions coming and everything else. It's not a problem. I go to a lot of meetings and people are complaining they got... Speakers up here speaking who talk about drugs. You can't relate to it. I've been to meetings where people in the audience jump up and say, we don't need you druggies here. And I go over to them and I tell them, what are you jumping on a speaker for? He's doing what he was asked to do. 
get the chairman who brought him up there. Chew him out if you don't want a drug speaker up here. That's the way you handle it, through a home group. You have a group conscience meeting. See? Because when I was sober about 16 or 17 years, I became an elder statesman. And I can relate to the elder statesman. I had a lot of time around here. I was active. And I sort of feel I could float now. Not do too much work. Just tell others what to do. We got a lot of elder statesmen today around our area. I don't know yours. They're not sponsoring anymore. They're not picking people up anymore. They're not making coffee anymore. They're not doing anything but telling other people how it should be. Be careful if you're in that category. The, that was a treacherous time for me. And another time I had problems in this program. Two times, serious problems. Once when I chose to live my life as if there was no God. And the second one is when I believed that I believed in God more than anyone else. That made as much problem for me as the other. Be careful of that. So I'm in here about three years, and Dan took me through the steps and he became my sponsor. Now here's the solution to most problems in Alcoholics Anonymous today. Good sponsorship. You see, it doesn't matter to me how you get into this room of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't care if the court sends you here, if the employer sends you here, your mother sends you here, your wife sends you here, you're here for a visit to see what it's like. It doesn't matter to me. What's important to me is when you get here, what happens to you after you get here? Does your group do like so many? Are there any new people here tonight? And a man raises his hand and everybody applauds for him. And then at the end of the meeting, they all go home and leave him standing there. Nobody approaches him, asks him if he has a sponsor, if he needs some help, if he needs a ride. Check and see if that's in your group. Now, my home group is an important tool in my program because sponsorship is an important part of my program. I'm sponsoring six people right now. You know why I'm sponsoring six? Because they can't get any. That's why I have six. I've been active since I've been in AA. And when my telephone rings and somebody asks me for help, I don't sit down on the edge of my bed and ask myself, is this person ready for AA? I ask myself, am I ready for this call? Because if I'm not going to devote the time necessary to give this person a program and follow up on them and take them to meetings, I better give it to somebody else. Anybody can hand somebody a sheet of paper and say, here's where the meetings are, go get them. And the home group is important. I have some of my home group members here today. I still make coffee. Anyway, I direct it. <laughs> so many groups I go to have three, four months chairman, three, four months secretary. Do you know why? Because they convinced the new man that he needs it. And he does it a couple of weeks, and then he convinces another new man. We don't have that longevity directing a group. And when a person asks me to be his sponsor, I have a requirement of him. If I'm going to sponsor you, you'll join my home group. And when you're at my home group every week, I'll direct your activities in the group. And I'll be there with you early so we can have a discussion before the meeting or after. But I'll see you once a week for sure. A lot of people say, I already have a home group. Can I get your sponsor there then? I believe this. You know. And Dan suggested I, I become active in a home group. Do you know why? Because that's the beginning of unselfishness. What do you do at a meeting? You become a service to somebody else. Because it doesn't end there. Not just at the meeting. And Dan told me, that selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of all our problems. Do you know why? That blocks God out from my life. And if I want to be a service, it allows God to come in. I make coffee, I set up chairs, I do all of these things. I don't just practice unselfishness at a meeting. I take it home with me. And at home I am boss. Nobody tells me how much soap to put in the water when I do the dishes. <laughs> and my wife and I believe in prayer. I'm developing a quality in my life today I've never had previous to the program of AA. 
a quality of faith, a belief in things unseen, and I can't define it to you. I don't know how God works. See? I don't know how. I think sometimes the people who think they know God are the ones that create the most problems. Good orderly direction in my life? Yes. I pray to a power greater than myself, of my understanding. And I have no problems with this. The only people that seem to have problems with the higher power in this program are Christians. You can, you know, everybody else can talk about a rock, a tree, a, a block of wood, a cup, a, a sky, a sunset, a tree. But if a Christian stands up and says, Jesus Christ is my higher power, everybody says, you're bringing religion in the program. That's his power. Let him have it. You know, don't deride them. It's a real power. But needless to say, I try to practice this program wherever I go, on a job. Boss came up to me one day and he said, Bill, for 25 years I've been in business. I've never had a man like you before, employee. You know why? I tried to give the man nine hours work for eight hours pay. I didn't try to give him one hour's work for nine hours pay. That's revolutionary for me. You become befuddled when you get employees like that. That's the attraction of AA members. And the neighbor said to me one day, he said, Bill, he said, what does that AA program do to you guys? I said, why, Andy? He said, if anybody had told me a few years ago that you would be living the life you're living today, I would have sat down in this curb and broke down laughing. I said, Andy, they give me a program to follow to bring God into my life, and now the kicker, and change the way that I live. See, I can talk to people about having a God, but if I'm living the same life, I'm kidding myself. When I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as we understood them, I made a decision that life was going to be different for me, not live the same life. That impressed Andy, because he didn't know how many meetings I was going to. He knew Bill Finley was not living the way he used to. There's the attraction of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got up in the morning. I prayed. I read the big book. I said the 24-hour uh, book. I got down, said my prayers. Then I come out of my bedroom like, like a tiger, you know. Don't talk to me. I haven't had my coffee yet. And I come back into my bedroom one day and I looked at it and it looked like a hurricane had gone through there. And I thought to myself, this room doesn't look like this when you come home. How come? Mommy cleans it. I was 35 years old. I've designated my mommy to be my maid for the rest of her natural life. Isn't that wonderful? So the following morning, instead of praying, I got up and cleaned my room and I came out with a smile and I felt better. Faith without works is dead. You know, you ever hear anybody with a quotes all the time? And there I was. I would I would rehearse my comments for a meeting. My favorite. If a man pursues pleasure with evil, the pleasure shall pass and evil shall remain. But if a man pursues good with labor, the labor shall pass and the good shall remain. I give that one night and old Irv Myers got quiet, he said, What the hell do we have AA lead for? Let's just have Finley comment. But I had to be above everything. Sharing for I went to a meeting one night and a man was leading. He came to the focal point of his lead. And somebody came in a room late and everybody forgot what Fred was saying. They turned around to see you come in late. I thought, how embarrassing for Fred. If I'm ever in a room and somebody comes in late, I won't turn my head to see who it is. Try it sometime. That's an impulse. A reaction. 500 pounds pressure. I resisted it. I resisted it. But that was an impulse. And I started recognizing there was other impulses that occurred in my life. Never thought about them. Just reacted. And I had to start catching some of those. Because that's what people in there say are triggers to relapse. See? Just reaction rather than thinking. A man was sentenced to the death camps in Second World War, Dr. Victor Frankl. He wrote a book, Search for Meaning. And he relates one of the experiences he had in his life in a death camp. He said he saw starving children who had the meager portions of food they were given stolen away from them because they were defenseless. 
and other people who couldn't stand the pain run and throw themselves in the fence, kill themselves. And other people who are in the same circumstances take half of what they had and share it with another individual. And when he wrote about that experience, he said, we as human beings have one freedom no one can ever take away from us. That's the freedom to choose our own attitude about any situation that we're in. And I find that to be true today. Attitudes play a lot with my sobriety. See, I go to the AA meetings and I hear people would say time and time again, I've had good days, I've had bad days. And I got to wondering one day, how could you have good days and bad days when your life is such a routine? We know just about what we're going to do every day. Our days are not that much out of the ordinary. The good days and bad days were determined by my attitude, you know. And if I let certain things outside of myself control my attitudes, I'm going to have a bad day. I am the man in charge of my attitude. You can make this the best conference in the world that you'll ever go to, right up here from the neck up. And you can make it the worst one you've ever been to, right here from the neck up, because we're in charge of that. That's what's meant in there when you say this is a thinking program, not a drinking program. Attitudes. Disease of attitudes. Prayer and fasting. Better men than we use prayer daily. Write a quote out of our book. Mahatma Gandhi changed the course, changed the course of history in India through prayer and fasting. Mother Teresa of Calcutta prayer and fasting. A woman from Baltimore sent her a letter. said, Mother Teresa, I'd like to come to Calcutta and work with you. She sent her back a letter and said, you have Calcutta in Baltimore. And that's what we have in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have Calcutta. There are some people in this room who may die because they don't get the message. You don't have to go too far to save people. It's right here in these rooms. Right here. We don't have to update this program. This program's good the way it is. A lot of people say, well, that's the way it used to be. No, that's the way it is. Alcoholics Anonymous is, not was. Here's a story. A little boy went to Sunday school class. He was going to update his Sunday school lesson. He came home and his mother asked him what he learned. He said, Mom, I learned the story of how Moses treated his people from Pharaoh in Egypt. He said, how's it go, son? If Moses kept harassing Pharaoh to let his people go. And Pharaoh got so tired of him, he agreed. So Moses brought his trucks down there, loaded his people up in his trucks, and started out across the desert. Pharaoh put his army in his trucks and started out after Moses, Mom. And Moses beat Pharaoh across the desert, and he came to a big lake. He said, God, I need some pontoons to build a bridge to get across this lake. God gave him some pontoons, he built a bridge, and he went across that lake. And he was on the other side, Pharaoh's army was coming on the same bridge. God, I need some grenades to blow that bridge up. God gave him some grenades, and he blew that bridge up, and he drowned Pharaoh's army. The mother looked at him and said, Son, I find that story difficult to believe. And the boy looked at him and said, Mom, if that's hard for you to believe, you should hear the way they told it to me. And if my story is hard for you to believe, look at the simple ones in the back of the book. Because that's what they are. Leads in the back of the book. If you can't make a meeting, read the story in the back of the book. I find out that my life is becoming better and better. You know, much better than it ever, ever was when I was handling it. All I do is take direction from God. You know, the ancient mariners, long before they had a compass, used the North Star for direction. They never got to the North Star, but because of the North Star, they would tell where they were going and how to get back. And in our area, in, in, in early AA, they had four North Stars. Honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. And at any given time, if I'm in question to what I'm doing, I just ask myself, is it honest, is it pure, is it unselfish, is it loving? And I could tell where I'm at and how to get back. And it works for me. It works for me. 
a little analogy of AA 12 steps, and maybe you'll understand this to show you how simple this program is. A man was in a restaurant eating breakfast, and everybody had come at him and say, Bill, how you doing? How's business? Fine. Going to be a millionaire soon. He said this several times. One day he got honest with himself. Why are you telling everyone you're successful when you're ready to go bankrupt? And as he's reading the newspaper, he reads a little ad, and it says, Consultants available for failing businesses, contact this number. And he called that number. He's done two things. He admitted the first, and he's working on the second. And the consultant came over and said, you're willing to turn your business over to me to run? Yep. All right. Turned it over to the consultant, and the consultant said, the first thing I want you to do is go in the warehouse and take an inventory. The man went into the warehouse, took an inventory, and said, and I want you to come back and tell me what's been losing money for you. Third, fourth, and fifth. Are you willing to have me remove these bad business practices? Yes, then ask me to, six and seven. Are you willing to make amends to the business people you cheated? Yes. Make the list and pay them back, eight and nine. Number ten, I want you to do this every day. Number eleven, I want you to call me up every day and tell me how you're doing. Get directions from me. Eleven. And then you're not only going to have a more successful business now, but I'm going to set you up as a consultant for other businesses. The twelve. It's exactly what we're doing with our life. Where's the delay? Where's the time formula in here? See? Am I ever tempted with alcohol? Yes. We deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. It doesn't say Bill go out and get drunk. I'll give you an example. I threw a lot of punches with this nose, and it's, it's hard for me to breathe through the right side. I cartilage in there or something. And one time I'm sucking air through that nostril, and they had just been over the holiday. The family had been around. They had beer in the refrigerator, eight or ten cans left. Every time I opened the door, it never bothered me. But this particular day, I'm laying in bed trying to get nose through that nostril, and the head went to the beer. Bill, there's beer in the refrigerator, and the other side said, so what? Go get a can of beer. For what? For your nose. <laughs> what does a can of beer have to do with your nose? Chug it. Yeah. You chug beer, what happens? Great gas, you have to burp. That's right. Hold your hand over your mouth and burp out your nose. That's an actual experience. Who else but an alcoholic would have to go through that routine to get a can of beer? See where we're at? These things are real. I said to a man one night, I said, Bruce, what's spirituality? He said, Bill, look out the window. What do you see? I said, I see a tree. He said, what's it doing? I said, it's blowing in the wind. He said, how do you know that? I said, I can see the tree moving. He said, did you ever see the wind? I said, no. He said, Bill, that's like spirituality in AA. All these people come into the rooms with the problems alcohol has created in their life. And through the simple admission of powerlessness and the acceptance of a power greater than themselves, the wind starts blowing. Now, we sat down tonight and we started this meeting off with a serenity prayer. How many of you ever sat on a bar stool, start out an evening or drink and say to your drinking buddy, let's say a prayer before we drink? <laughs> Wouldn't work, would it? The does here. You see, the wind starts blowing immediately when you start participating in that prayer in a meeting. And when we close this meeting, we close with the Lord's Prayer. And that's the wind blowing in our life. And one day after you swear to God, you're never going to. You find yourself behind a podium like me, speaking to a group of people you don't even know, telling them how rotten you are. The only program in the world where a person stands up and publicly denounces himself, everybody else achieving. I was getting initiated into the Lions Club one time. And the clerk, of course, is uh, my sponsor. He's reading from a long list of accomplishments, you know. And half the guys down there with their head in their hands going to sleep. I'm trying to give Frank the high time. Cut it off. They were attorneys who defended me in court, and I still owe them money. <laughs> Where else but in AA do we do this? 
And one winter evening, there may be a blizzard outside and your telephone will jangle. 1.30, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. Call for help. And if you're anything like me, you're going to complain all the way out. But you're going to go. Because like the thousands of alcoholics before you, starting with Bill and Dr. Bob, we have been given the gift of healing another sick person. And that's what we do when we go on a 12-step call. You see, I don't do 12-step work to recruit for AA. I do 12-step work for insurance on my own drinking. And if the man doesn't come, that doesn't mean I did a bad 12-step. I stayed sober. I have never been on an unsuccessful call yet. Mentioned in Bill's history. He said, Lois, six months, I haven't sobered up another alcoholic. But all that I've seen, she said, yes, but you have stayed sober. There's the clue. Now, I'm going to tell you something about 12-step work before I get sidetracked again. I have yet to read in the big book of AA and the directions of working with others where it says making coffee at your home group is 12-step work. It gives me a path to follow to carry the message to an alcoholic. That's group work. Working with others has a whole chapter dedicated to it. I'll bet you not too many people read it. You keep that wind blowing in your life and you don't drink. And then the miracle occurs. The biggest miracle in my life today is not the fact that I haven't had a drink in 35 years. The biggest miracle in my life today is the fact my head's not bombarded with thoughts about alcohol anymore. I've been released from that. It doesn't enter my mind as a solution. If I had to fight alcohol every day the way I did when I came in here, I would not be here today. And read what it says after the 10th step. The closest thing I can give is a definition to recovered. We have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, sanity will have returned. Read that. It's important. Miracle. How do you go to a family and say, I'm sorry I killed your son? How do you make an amend for that? I went to a meeting one night and I led the meeting. And after I was through speaking, a man came up to me and he said, December 26, 1956, I hated your guts. I could have killed you. I said, I don't know who you are, sir. He said, I'm Joey's brother. And Joey was the young boy that was in a car with me that was killed when I had my accident. And he pointed to the wall and he said, you see that girl there? I said, yes. He said, when nobody would help that girl, including her own family, even her father, you got her well. She's well today. That's my daughter. And he reached across the table and he shook my hand and he said, I know better now. Because they tried to get me back in prison when I was out. You want to talk to me about 90 meetings in 90 days? I don't know where that ever got started. What's going to happen to you in 90 days? One day at a time, as far as I go. That's what I learned in AA. Stay sober one day at a time and you'll build a whole new way of life. Don't shoot for the future. One day at a time. Things got better for me. I retired. I got something I want to read for you. If I find it. From the county commissioners in Lorraine County. I just read the last two paragraphs because it's the part I brag about. <laughs> and this is what it says. Think of this. You heard my story. Further be it resolved that we wish for Bill's continued success in any future endeavors and wish him and his family the very best of health and happiness in his retirement. He has further resolved that we hereby proclaim August 28, 1996, as William E. Finley Day in Lorraine County and ask citizens to join in the recognition of this special day. A drunken, stumblebum alcoholic came into AA to have his last drink in 1964 and had a day of celebration for the whole county. You want to sit down there and tell me AA doesn't work? It works if you work it. it. Close on a light note. I run across this prayer. Maybe you can relate to it. The alcoholic's daily prayer. 
So far today, God, I've done all right. I haven't had a drink, haven't gossiped, haven't lost my temper, haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, or self-centered. I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed, and then I'm going to need a lot of help. Thank you. <laughs> Join the Lord's Prayer now. Close with the Lord's Prayer now. Okay, that's, I wish everybody in here happy sobriety and the best of life in your program. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please support the channel by liking and subscribing.